All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Alyssa and I'm on the marketing team here at Brian Tracy International. You all know the man to my left, of course. Um, some of you may remember me from the Million Dollar Habits live event that we did about a month ago now, um, but we're so excited to be back and doing another live event with you guys. Um, if you've arrived, let's pop in and just say hi, say your name, say where you're from. Um, we can start getting some engagement going on that channel. Uh, we really want this to be an, an interactive experience today. So if you guys hear something that you like, give us a like. If you have a question, of course, comment it and share it with your friends. Um, we want a lot of people to be able to hear what Brian has to say today. Um, so let's see. We got about 200 people tuning in now. Hi, Kim. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Shannon from Springfield, Illinois. Um, hi, Lonzo from Florida. Lots of people all over the place. Um, awesome. Very exciting. Okay, so um, we're in for a special treat today because Brian is going to be talking about a subject that I know he's very passionate about and has written many, many books and courses on, um, how to put together a business plan in an hour. Um, so before we get started and I hand it over to Brian, I want to let you guys know that we have a useful tool that Brian has assembled that might help you follow along as we talk about how to put together a business plan in an hour. It's an 11 page questionnaire and if right now you go to briantracy.com slash business plan, all one word, you can download that right now and kind of walk through it as we go. So prob probably a helpful tool. It's really good. I've gone through it. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, I think really the big question here, Brian, you know, over the years in your seminars and courses, you've talked about how important it is to have a solid business plan. So can you explain why a solid business plan is so crucial to the early stages of a business? Well, every minute spent in planning saves 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 100 minutes or hours in execution. And just like you wouldn't uh, go shopping without a grocery list or go on vacation without a, a list of the things you're going to take with you, you wouldn't try to build a birdhouse without a plan. And yet more than 50% of businesses um, or business owners try to start a business without a plan. And 80 to 90% of them go broke. And why is it that they go broke? Well, it's the equivalent of driving off across a strange country in Europe with no road signs and no road maps and no knowledge of the language. You just drive around and you're lost all the time until finally you run out of money. 99% of entrepreneurial ventures started without a business plan collapse in time because the person just runs out like a person drives out into the desert with not enough gas and then gets out of the vehicle and just walks. Uh, so a business plan forces you to think through the most important things that you have to do in order to be successful. The worst thing about not having a business plan is not just the money, but it's the amount of time. People often spend weeks and months and years of their lives, which is irreplaceable, to try to make a business successful when it was not necessary, and then they failed. And they failed because someone says, well, what was your, where was your plan? What was your goal in these areas? What were your answers? They said, what, what, what? <laughs> so, so I began teaching this decades ago. I've done strategic planning now for several billion dollar corporations and countless smaller companies all over the world. And they say it's basically transforms a business. It just totally changes the way people think about their business and their results transform as well. Absolutely, and we're getting tons more people tuned in here. We have almost 400 so far, so hello to everyone else that has joined. Um, please leave your comments and questions. And again, we have a free questionnaire for you guys to download at www.briantracy.com slash business plan. All right, let's get into some of these questions. Um, let's see. Okay, so Monica has a question. How should you start a business and go about putting together your business plan together when you know that you have lower income? What's a good place to start? Well, there's, there's a book that came out a couple of years ago, 1,001 Ways to Start a Business with $50 or Less. The biggest single reason why people don't start a business is, oh, I don't have enough money and nobody will give me any or lend me any. Well, I told you there's a 99% failure rate on entrepreneurial businesses. So only a complete idiot would give a person money to start a business. Banks do not lend money to business startups. We say that there's, there's only three people, uh, fools, um, friends, and, and, and yourself that will give money to, uh, but a fools, friends, and family that will give money to a new person because as far as they're concerned, it's basically throwing it on the roulette table. 
However, you can start a business with $50 or less. There's several hundred reasonably good MLM companies and some exceptional ones. And with them, you pay a small amount, you buy product uh, after you've sold it, you make a profit. As a result, you take the profit and reinvest it. In fact, one of the most powerful ways to build businesses, including companies like Microsoft, is, is called bootstrapping. Whereas the person starts off with no money, but what they do is they create a small product or represent a small product or get a license for a small product, and they sell the money and make a profit and they grow out of that. Some of the biggest companies in America, some of the biggest fortunes in the world, were started with a person with no money, just bootstrapped. Just made a few sales, took the money, and reinvested it. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Um, let's see. Shantuan um, asked an interesting question earlier when we were promoting the event. Um, I think an important part of developing your business and being able to build that customer base is having them be able to develop trust in you. Right. How do you account for you know building that relationship with your customers, targeting the right customers to build that trust when you're putting together your business plan? Well, you don't build trust before you do a business plan. That's like saying you start construction of a home before you have a blueprint. What you do is you do a business plan which asks and answers every critical detail of the business and only then do you begin. It's like say going on a vacation and then deciding to get some gas on a map. The business plan comes first and it must be complete and it must be reviewed and thought through and and then you must have what we call proof of concept is many people do a business plan but it's uh, an ideal business plan but it has there's no proof so what you do with every single number in detail is you have to go out and get proof that it's true i read this wonderful line last week it said if you don't have data then all you have is an opinion and the reason 80, 90% of new businesses fail is because all they have is an opinion <laughs> instead of data. So setting, doing the business plan is like preparing the soil to plant the crop in on a farm. You have to do an enormous amount of preparation before you put in the seed and then an enormous amount of tilling before the crop comes up and you can harvest it. Great. Thanks, Brian. Um, Eric Silberger just asked an interesting question. How do you find the right people to work with and how do you account for and discover your weaknesses and address those in your business plan when you're putting that together? Well, the first thing you do is you, you do the business plan and this has nothing to do with finding people to work with. You have to have the plan first, is work with on what, do what, accomplish what goal, how do you measure it? You know, the three critical factors in business based on some of the most extensive research ever done in history are first of all very clear written goals and plans and second of all very clear measures or standards for the accomplishment of every goal and third of all is very clear deadlines and sub deadlines for the accomplishment of the activities those three are absolutely essential before you get up in the morning in terms of business and they are explain more than 80 percent of the reasons why business businesses succeed or fail what a business plan does is it simply asks you a series of questions as I say, I've done this with many large companies, and I simply put together a large, much more extensive questionnaire, and we just walk through the questions. And I send them this material as pre-work, so they're forced to think through what they're going to answer in the group with all these questions, and then we walk it through and we agree, step by step, and then we assemble it into a blueprint, and then we build the house. And it's astonishing, companies, including very large old companies, can transform if they have a good business plan. Excellent. Thanks, Brian. Um, and how many of you guys thought that was a great answer? We'd love to hear it. Go ahead and like this video, share this video, and keep leaving comments. These questions are all great. Um, TC Chesler, or Chesser, excuse me, and NJ Mughal both asked kind of a similar question. Um, once you kind of have the business plan created or you feel, you feel good about what you're starting with, how do you move forward with putting that into action and staying accountable to that business plan? Well, uh, you, I teach a lot about time management, but time management means setting larger goals and then setting daily goals and then set, setting hourly goals. Napoleon Hill, who wrote all the books in the 30s about success, concluded after the most exhaustive interviews with the most successful self-made multimillionaires in history that self-discipline was the most important quality of success. And I've spoken to a very good friend of mine, he's dead now, he spent 54 years studying success, 
he actually identified 1,000 success principles in America. And I asked him, what's the most important principle of all? And he said, self-discipline. He said, if you have self-discipline, the other 999 principles work. If you don't have self-discipline, nothing works. So the rule is plan your work and work your plan. But here's a very important thing, and, and people kind of, are like a fish on a hook, they wriggle about this, is the key to success is high sales. The key to f failure is low sales. His businesses succeed because they have high sales, and they fail because they have low sales. So when you're talking about a business plan, the most important question is, what are you gonna sell and who are you gonna sell it to and why will they buy it? And then what you do in business is you spend 80% of your time all day long selling your product. We find that most entrepreneurs today, a tragedy, is they spend 80% of their time on uh, the internet. And they think that they're actually making sales. Or they send out offerings and they wonder if they, they think their internet is broken because there's no responses. And I've seen some big companies in Silicon Valley start off with this. And they have a great product idea and they send it out to thousands of people and it's silent. There's no response. So they call them up and they say, well, we sent you a free email or a free sample of our new product. They said, you did? And they said, you didn't even reply. You didn't even take the free product. Said, no. They said, I wouldn't even take that product if it was free. It's, it's a completely useless product. It's uninteresting to me. You know, 80% 80, 80 of people or more, according to Forbes, their businesses fail because customers have no desire for the product. They just simply don't want what you're selling. And many people actually start a business selling a product and they never even ask a customer, you want this? No, they th and they don't sell it, they put it on the internet. <laughs> and they think, you know, you've got, we have now 36 million people selling products on the internet. And how are you gonna, you know, get their attention? You've got 36 million people doing everything they possibly can, including giving away the house and the car and the store and everything else to get you to respond to a free offering. I mean, so we go, well, I'll just put it on the internet. No, what you have to do is you have to go out and knock on doors and get face to face with people and tell them why they should buy your product and get them to make a uh, decision and give you the money. I just finished a seven part program and the sixth part is closing the sale. I learned when I was a young person knocking on doors that if you can't close the sale, then you go, out, go back home and go to bed, pull up the covers over your head and maybe listen to music on your earphones. But if you cannot ask a person to buy your product, then uh, stay at home because, because you cannot build a successful business. Awesome, Brian. And I think a lot of what that comes down to, if you're really struggling selling your product, no matter where you're trying to sell it, is what I've heard you talk about time and time again, but the, the idea of what is your unique value proposition. Right. Um, and that's something, again, that Brian addresses in this questionnaire. Um, briantracy.com slash business plan. You can download it if you need to. Can you talk a little bit more, Brian, about the importance of figuring out what your value proposition is before you move forward with any sort of marketing or selling or anything like that? Well, well, I, I teach a program, two-day program, all over the world called Business Model Reinvention. And the reason I wrote this one, uh, our business plan, is because my son is starting a business. And I said to him, well, what about this and what about this, David? And he said, what? I said, well, what about this and what about what? And I realized he didn't know the basics. It's not... He's a very smart college graduate, hard worker, good sales guy, but nobody had ever explained to them that one and one is two and two and two is four, and there's a logical orderly process. So the starting point is, what is your product? And what people make the mistake of is they think, well, my product is this or that or something else. No, people only buy the transformation or difference or improvement that your product will bring about in their lives. Is the product is merely a vehicle. People don't care about the product or what it is, they only care what the product does. So when we have our uh, business owners, we bring them together and we say, now sit in a stool like this, now tell the audience what you sell. What is it that you sell? And don't tell us about the name of your product or your service or your company or your industry. Just tell us what's going to happen in the life of a person that will make it different if they buy and use your product. But don't tell us what the product is. We don't want to hear, we don't care about the product, we only care about the improvement or the transformation and you know that 80 90 percent of business people go huh they say well, well you know i sell this and it's this product and it's got this no nobody cares all they care about is how it changed my life how it changed my life and so that's what you sell you you are basic in the business of changing and improving the lives of potential customers and if that's an improvement or change that they want then they'll buy for example lose 30 pounds in 30 days um unconditionally guaranteed Call this number. 
That's about a five second advertisement. And every single person who wants to lose weight immediately goes boing, because that's exactly the value offering they want. They don't care about the product. They don't care about the ingredients and the details and how many years you spent developing and how many valleys in, 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 in uh, Fiji it comes from and so on and so forth. All they want is the result. They say, you want the result? Call here. Okay, good. But you have to be clear what the result is. And then you have to say, who else or what else is offering the same result, change, improvement, or difference? And why is your superior? Why is your approach to this change or, or, or transformation superior to that of anybody else? And you must be so crystal clear about that that a person is going to wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, what's your unique selling proposition? You can open your eyes and tell them. And it is verifiable by data. It can be proven by objective researchers in the market that what you offer is definitely superior, objectively speaking. So important. Unique value proposition, guys. Actually, I'm sure Brian would love to see if you have decided on a unique value proposition um, that you feel is very strong, go ahead and share it because we'd love to see and Brian will certainly be taking a look at these comments later. So we'll leave that if, you, if you'd like. Um, another great question, kind of one of the more um, very, very early stages of putting together a business plan. Matthew Pacheco asked this question. I think when you make the decision to put together a business plan, that means that you want to start a business. You want to be potentially your own boss, someone mm -hmm. else's boss. What kind of understanding or comfortability do you need to have um, to get comfortable being the boss and putting together this business plan and kind of the mental ownership there? Well, when you start a business, uh, the enormous, uh, millions and millions and millions today are solopreneurs, solopreneurs. That's one person. So you're the boss of yourself and that's it. It's a long way. I've worked with hundreds, thousands of solopreneurs in seminars and workshops and they don't have any staff. And as a matter of fact, they really don't intend to have any staff. They run a small business. So forget about hiring people and especially hiring people to do the job. You know, I'm going to hire people to sell my product. <laughs> Wow, you must be smoking something really good and you should share it with everybody. <laughs> it is not going to happen. Uh, what, this is what I wanted to say. I say your primary goal in your work life, however many decades it is, is to achieve financial independence. If you're really fortunate, you'll become wealthy. And that's eminently possible because it's faster and easier to start a business today in America or the world than it has ever been in all of human history. When I started my first business, this is I had to sell my house and sell my car and my furniture and spend thousands of dollars outfitting an office and buying equipment and everything else. Today, you can start a business and be operational with legal zoom in 50, in, for, for $50 in 15 minutes. It's unbelievable. And you can be in business. If it doesn't work, you can start another business this afternoon. I mean, it's never been easier. So your goal is to become financially independent. So what I began studying many years ago when I was broke, is how do people become financially independent, if not wealthy? And what I studied for decades and still do is self-made millionaires. Today, I'm doing a full court press on self-made billionaires. We find that 87% of billionaires in the world today started with zero in, this, in the course of their working career. And as you know, some of them are in their 30s and 20s and 40s and so on. So they all had certain qualities and characteristics. It's almost like they, it's almost like they used to drop the, the little uh, uh, bits of food in order to lead the animal to the to the trap. They all have. They all show that there's success leads tracks, and they all leave tracks. And if you follow the tracks, your income goes up dramatically. So what I learned is that if you want to be financially independent or wealthy, both of which are never been more possible than today, then you have to start a business. It's as simple as that. There's they, they say a job is just over broke and nobody ever got rich working for someone else unless you started at the beginning of a tremendous uh, high-tech startup and you got stock options. A lot of people did that. But basically what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do it 100% yourself. So if you're going to take a trip in business, get a business plan. Sit down and answer the questions. Success starts with this. Starts with a business plan and a pen. And what you do is you fill in the answers. I just reviewed a business plan with an entrepreneur yesterday and he had done a great job. He had thought through virtually every single answer in the business plan and he was ready to go to work. And I'm doing it with another entrepreneur uh, either later on today or tomorrow and what he does is just fill in the answers. You fill in the blanks and at the end it's almost like 
you're ready to go to work. And if you don't know the answers, well, then you find them. And they're not, it's not hard to do it, but it's the same as having a GPS or no GPS in a foreign country or a map or no map in a foreign country. It's a very simple thing, but if you have it, it makes an extraordinary difference. So if you want to become wealthy, what you have to do is you have to sell, you have to sell more stuff. This is as simple as that. Every single business, General Motors, uh, Microsoft, Apple, they're successful because they sell more stuff. Apple got into trouble because it sold less stuff. And they said, well, this is not working, so we have to find a way to sell more stuff. So they did and created the most valuable company in the history of the world. So that's what you have to do. And there's no way to get around it, and nobody else will do it for you. Great, Brian, thank you. Um, we're getting some people sharing their unique value proposition. Stoyan shared his. Other people are saying this is great. Some people are just tuning in, so hello to Troy. Um, thanks for joining everyone. Um, let's get back to some good questions here. Eric Manthe asked a good one. Um, once you put together your business plan and you're kind of using that to guide your business, how often should you plan to revisit that or make adjustments, if at all? Well, at the beginning, uh, you should make adjustments continually. Just keep going back, maybe look at it once a week, once a month. Many people who started businesses, according to Inc. Magazine, and the fastest growing businesses, many of them spent as much as 18 months doing their business plan. They were working for other companies and they saved their money and uh, they did it by themselves or they got together with a couple of other people, 12 to 18 months. And then they started and their business became a tremendous success. They did a study, they took 100 entrepreneurs that had started new businesses and they divided them up into 50 that had business written business plans before they began, 50 that didn't. At the end of like one or two years, 49 of the 50 uh, that didn't were broke and 49 of the 50 that did were, were flourishing. And I spoke with a company just the other day and I worked with them when they started their business with two guys with a business plan. They spent 18 months really doing the research on a business plan. Today they're one of the biggest and most successful companies in America. These guys have got tens of millions of dollars. They've made tens of thousands of people rich and healthy. Why? It's because the business plan was so solid. But here's what they found with Inc. They said, how often did you revisit the business plan? And most of them said, once a year. They just, once they'd finished it, which forces you to think through every important part of the business, gives you clear guidance, if you like. They threw the business plan in a drawer and went to work. And speaking of step-by-step -step business plans, if you haven't downloaded um, Brian's 11-page questionnaire, you can find that at briantracy.com slash business plan. Yeah, it's called the one hour one business plan. One right. hour business plan. Here's what right. it looks like. And there's, you know, there's three day business plans, but this is one hour. This is, you can complete all 15 questions in one hour. And the most wonderful thing is you say, I don't know the answer to this question. Oh, oh, that means you're on an open highway with no road signs and no roadmaps. So what it does, maybe I should find out the answer to this. By the way, we call a unique value proposition is the key to success in business is you offer something that no one else offers. Now here's something where people got confused. It's the word unique. You know, I speak different languages and parts of other languages. And the word unique in every language means one and only in the entire world. There is no other than this in the entire world. That is a unique selling proposition. And it's something that individuals, customers really want and are willing to pay money for that unique thing that only you or your company does in the world. So people say, well, my unique selling proposition is I've got a positive mental attitude. Well, so do 100 million other people. What else you got? Well, uh, I'm a hard worker, eh? 500 million of those. What, what else? It has to be unique. It has to be something that nobody in the world has. But that being said, I do a lot of work in the real estate industry. And just, just yesterday, in fact, I was working with one of the biggest real estate organizations um, in the world. And we talk about real estate. We say, well, all the real estate's for sale on the multiple listing service on, 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 online. You can go and check every house that's available, how you, can you be unique if the homes are all available to all real estate agents? I said it's very simple. You can be unique in the quality of your personality and your preparation and your helpfulness and your courtesy and your perceived value to your customers. So after a prospective buyer or seller has met you, they would not think of dealing with anyone else because they like you and trust you so much. So that is where you can be unique in all the world because nobody can be like you. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. 
Um, Kinga Hibby just asked a really interesting question, and this was actually an idea that came up during our habits discussion too. Right. Um, does it make sense or is it possible to run two or three businesses at the same time with full commitment, or should you really just focus on that one? That's a great question. And the, and the answer is to make one business successful, you have to put in an enormous amount of heart and energy. So what I say is, first of all, if you're going to start a business, you must love the product for yourself. You must use the product. You must sell it or give it to your mother and father and brother and sister and wife and husband and children and best friends. When they interviewed the uh, founders of the, uh, the Inc. 500 last year, these are the 500 fastest growing companies in America. The, uh, these companies grow two, three, four, five, tens. The company that grew the most grew 42,000% in three years. Many of them grew 100 times, 300 times, 500 times. The biggest was 42,000%. So they interviewed them and they said, how'd you get into this business anyway? Every single one of the founders said, I like the product so much, I wanted it for myself. And so I started either producing it or buying it or importing it for myself. And other people said, can I have that too? And I said, sure. And suddenly I realized, you know, there's a business here. The founder of eBay, Pierre Omidar, had a collection of Pez dispensers back in the day. And he, all his life, since the time he was a child, he collected Pez dispensers. And there's, believe it or not, there's an underground market for trading Pez dispensers, like baseball cards or stamps or things like that. So he wanted to open the market to more people. So he created this little eBay and he offered his Pez dispensers sort of at an auction. That was the beginning of eBay. He did it because he wanted to sell his own products. And the people who grew 42,000%, they started this product, which exploded. It grew 138,000%, by the way, in the next five or six years. It exploded because they wanted it for themselves and their family. And they produced it for themselves and their family. And all the neighbors said, can we have that too? And more neighbors and more cities and more states. And the, the d demand was just like an avalanche. But it starts off with you loving the product for yourself. Now the second thing that's really important is you have to love your customers. You have to really care emotionally about helping your customers to improve the quality of their lives. And then you have to be willing to work very, very hard in order to combine the product you love with the customers you care about. Great points. Thanks, Brian. Um, let's see here. Nicolette just made an interesting comment that I think you'll like. She said, starting her business plan is her frog. It's her, it's her big hurdle that she yes. has to jump over. Um, for those of you who have read Eat That Frog, which I'm sure are many of you, Brian's great, great book. You should read it if you haven't. Um, okay, so I think another important part of the business plan that we haven't really addressed yet is kind of the, the financials and thinking yes. about your finances moving forward. So if any of you are watching and you know someone that definitely needs help with the finances of their business plan, go ahead and share this video because we're gonna talk about some financials right now. Well, the reason we wrote this one hour business plan and by the way, I'm now starting to get, get demand from all over the country for people. One gentleman called me, he's got 100 uh, clients in one company, and he needs this for all those clients before they do the national meeting. And he looked at this and he said, the darn thing is brilliant. It is so simple. It's basically question and answer. It's just like, a, like what, what is your favorite food? And how tall are you? And what car do you drive? And where do you live? The questions are very simple. You answer the questions, and they start from the very general, and they start to become more and more precise. And as you answer the questions, within 60 minutes, you have answered all the key questions, or you know the key questions you have to get more answers for. It's so simple. And business people, I will tell you, hate business planning. They hate the idea of making a business plan. Every single entrepreneurial teacher says, step one, write up your business plan. And most people never do it because they hate it. That's why I did the one hour business plan. Anybody in order to potentially start on the journey of wealth can put aside an hour. If you can't put aside an hour, if you don't have the discipline to turn off your television and put aside an hour to think through the key questions about a business, well, that will tell you something about your likelihood of ever succeeding at anything in life. It'll just tell you very clearly, there it is. Definitely, thanks Brian. Um, let's see here. 
Abraham, or Abraham, excuse me if I'm not saying that correctly, made an interesting point a while back um, when you were talking about your unique value proposition. He made a point that he thinks it's more about the presentation. And I know that's kind of one of the P's that you address in this one-hour business plan is the, the packaging and the promotion. Can you talk a little bit about how important that is to, to put together something that resonates with what your customers need? Well, I, I can only tell you, I put in hundreds and hundreds and thousands of hours on this subject, including today, shooting some video on the presentation. And yes, the presentation is very important. But it, here's a very interesting question. The, the question is, what is the most important sale? And most people say, the first sale. Well, the interesting thing is you can get the first sale by promises, discounts, deceit, bonuses. You can get the first sale with every trick in the commercial marketing book. The most important sale is the second sale. The second, the first sale, you make promises, and they could be a beautiful presentation, but it boils down to promises. Is that if you do buy my product or service, I promise you, you will get these benefits. And so if a person says, okay, all right, I'll do it, I'll, uh, I'll accept what you say, because you're now selling promises in exchange for money. I'll give you the money in exchange for your promises. The second sale, when they come back to buy again, is where they say, buy gum, you fulfilled your promises. This product really does what you say it will do and better than anybody else, and I'm back, and I'm bringing my friends. So the major reason that businesses fail is they're slick, and they have a great presentation, but then when people consume or use the product or service, they don't get what they were promised, and they never buy again. I used to be work for a major advertising agency, and in studying it said, the fastest way to kill your business is to promote and advertise a poor product. Because by doing that, people will quickly buy it and tell everybody else it's no good, and you'll be out of business. So what is most important is that it's a good product, and then you present it well. It's like a, it's like a beautiful restaurant where you serve beautiful food, and then when you serve, bring it to the table, it's beautifully presented. That's the presentation, but the food has got to be good. Absolutely. Um, Brian, you mentioned earlier you used the word solopreneur, yes. um, and I'm sure we have a lot of solopreneurs watching. Go ahead and give us a like if you're a solopreneur. We love to hear from you guys. Um, Lei Hing asked a little while ago, specifically for solopreneurs, people that yes. are you know bootstrapping it on, on their own, like you mentioned earlier, yes. do you have any tips specifically for those people? Well, the, I mentioned Napoleon Hill earlier, and I taught this and others. Napoleon Hill found that all the people that were the richest people in America, the Rockefellers and the, and, the, and the Mellons and the Fords and the Carnegies and so on, they all started with nothing. Many of them were just immigrants. Many of them just started off on the street. Carnegie, who became the richest man in America, arrived on a pilgrim ship when he was 14 years old and was put in a boys home and got his first job working in a steel mill when he was 15 and he was only about five foot two inches tall. And all of these people started with nothing and then what happened? Well, what they did is they set very clear goals for themselves and uh, then they began to grow and then they needed help. When I started my business, after working for many other businesses, when I started my business, I was a solopreneur. I worked out of my own house. I uh, made my own phone calls, I made my own sales calls, and then I delivered, produced and delivered my own products and then took the money and put it in the bank and paid for the rent and then went back and did it again, over and over again, for about three years. I worked 10, 12 uh, hours a day, uh, minimum of six days a week. I had, I had patches under my eyes, black patches, that some years later, when I could afford it, I had to go to a plastic surgeon to get them removed because I looked like a, a, a ghost or something. Yeah. And so you start as a solopreneur, and when you add to your staff, it's because you're doing so much business that you need help. And then what you start is to get a little assistant. First thing that solopreneurs do is get an assistant to do all the little stuff so that they can do more of the selling stuff. And then you get an assistant to do more of the shipping and details so the solopreneur can do more of the selling stuff. <laughs> and you just keep hiring people to do non-selling stuff so you can do more of the selling stuff. And that's basically been the key to success all, all over the world. Absolutely. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, um, Muhammadi, Muhammadi, yes, um, just asked, he said he's going to begin a business with three of his friends. Is it possible to make a business with that many people or do you kind of recommend doing it alone? What do you right, well, here's, here's, uh, I know a lot about this. 
Here's the answer. If you're going to have four partners, you have to have a partnership agreement. The partnership agreement clearly specifies what each person is going to do. And in an initial partnership, each person should be doing something that is fundamental to the success of the business and different from the others. The only exception is if two of them are salespeople or three of them are salespeople and one is the office administrator and so on. The next thing you have to do is write an agreement that is a walk away agreement. So that if you become unhappy, it's clearly specified exactly how you can leave or for each of the others, how they can leave. And that agreement must be signed, sealed and so on. Most partnerships fail and they fail for this reason. And you, by the way, I, when I say this, you'll know what I'm talking about. They fail because one person works harder and the other one works less. If you have three or four people, there's one person who is willing to work 10, 12 hours a day. And there's another one who just wants to coast a little bit. And there's another one who wants to do nine to five, but be a business owner. So this, this leads to the death of the business. I'll give you two examples, um, Steve Jobs and Steve Rosniak. Steve Jobs was a workaholic, a fanatic. And after the Apple computer started to sell, is uh, Wozniak just kind of backed off. He just wanted to hang around and shoot the breeze with people and come in late and go for coffee and so on. Same thing with Bill Gates and um, his partner. Um, Bill Gates was a workaholic and his partner, Paul Allen, his Paul just you know, grew a big beard and came in and hung around with the staff. He said, why should I work hard anymore? And in both cases, they were both forced out by the founders, bought out, became very wealthy for that matter. But here you have it. Two of the biggest companies in the world, the biggest problem was one didn't want to work as much as the founder. So be very alert to that because it kills the business. Eventually, you become very resentful. The one who doesn't work wants the same amount of money as the one who does work. The one who doesn't get results wants the same split as the people who are out there working all day long. It's, anyway, that's something to watch out for. Yeah, definitely something to be wary of. Um, and Ivan just asked an interesting question to follow up on that. If you are starting a business plan or a business by yourself, based on what you just said and kind of what to watch out for if you're starting with a lot of people, at what point after you get your business to a good, a good spot, could you consider bringing in more team members? Well, remember, what we used to teach this for our solopreneurs and entrepreneurs is the very first thing you do is you sort of kind of, kind of just lay out what is it that you do to, to drive revenues. See, the whole purpose of a business is SMS, sell more stuff. That's it, day in and day out. Well, the entrepreneur who is cheap, who is, has the ability to earn $50,000 a year, which is $25 an hour, or $100 an hour, which is 100,000 a year, this person is cheap and they start typing their own email messages and they start packing their, their own goods and they start washing their own car, making their own copy, making their own photo copies. No! The very first thing you do when you start to succeed is you get an assistant to do all the little stuff. And you work up from the bottom and then you get a second assistant. One of my friends, just here last week, I've known her for years. She started off, she was making about $38,000 a year. She's working 60 hours a week in her sales business. And I explained this to her. She went back and she got an assistant, half time, and the assistant took away half of her work. She couldn't believe how much trivia she was doing. Soon she hired the assistant full time and her income went from $38,000 to $100,000 a year because now she was selling stuff all day long. And she became so busy she hired a second assistant, a third assistant, and then a half time assistant. Within two years she was making $350,000 a year and working 38 hours a week. She, she had her whole life under control and every small job was done by her assistants. They cost her about $100,000 a year to handle 100% of it, but now she's working 38, 40 hours a week. She's making, taking home $250,000 and, and she has, and is still has a wonderful life. Awesome. Good for her. Yeah. Um, okay. I think Muhammad asked an interesting question. So this, this one hour business plan that we've been talking about, this free questionnaire, you can download it right now, briantracy.com slash business plan, completely free. Um, is this enough? to get you started or would you recommend yeah. anything else specific for them to well, also do? Well, of, of course, what this will do is it'll sort of open your eyes. Remember, to, to be a solopreneur, entrepreneur, business owner, this is a profession. You can earn more than doctors, lawyers, architects, engineers, dentists. This is a profession where there's no limit on how much you can earn. You can go bigger and bigger and bigger, but you've got to become professional. You cannot become a, a casual person as my 
friend Jim Rohn used to say, casualness breeds casualties. And in business, the reason 80% of business people, entrepreneurs and solopreneurs are starving is because they're casual about these things. Then you have to get serious and become a lifelong student of the business process. You have to study it and study. I have been in this business for a long time, but I spend three hours a day studying and learning new things. I read books, I read articles, I read um, uh, assessments and reviews and previews on the uh, internet. I uh, subscribe to newsletters. I subscribe to 20 magazines on business and other activities. I am constantly learning new stuff. And sometimes one idea, I've had this occasion three times, one idea was worth a million dollars to me in the following two years. It's, it's just, you're just shaking your head. You can't believe it. But you've got to keep feeding yourself. So listen to audio programs, read books, attend courses and seminars. And one thing which I skipped over a little while ago, what Napoleon Hill found was that the turning point for each of these solopreneurs when it was when they began to get together once a week with other solopreneurs and share ideas. And they call this masterminding. Sometimes if there's more people, they call it networking. But masterminding means you ask some other people who are in probably different businesses, and you say, let's get together for breakfast or lunch once a week, and let's just talk about business and what we're learning and what's going on. And that turned to be almost like the inflection point. Their lives were struggle, 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 and they started to mastermind and their lives took off and they became some of the richest people in the world. So my suggestion to you is get together at three to five, and five is about the best maximum, and get together for lunch uh, or breakfast and you can either pick a subject, you know, getting more customers, or you can throw it open and say, what would we like to talk about today? And just make sure that everybody gets a chance to talk and sometimes somebody will come up with an idea that just will pull, knock you off your chair. That's exactly the idea that you needed to transform your business. But the masterminding concept is a wonderful concept. I think that might be a misconception that a lot of you know burgeoning business owners might have is I want to do this thing and I should keep it to myself because it's such a good idea. But in reality, they should share their knowledge, like you said, kind of like we're doing today. Yeah. <laughs> and ask for advice. What are you doing? I, I remember when I was selling door to door. I was not even in my own business. I was selling for someone else. And I was having a terrible time closing sales. Uh, and so I began to study closing sales. I got every book that I could. I studied and studied. I was, rather than going out in the evenings, I couldn't afford it anyway because I had no money. I would study. I'd get up at six in the morning, study. And I'd come home in the evening, I'd study. Anyway, one morning, I was up at six o'clock. I started work at eight, knocking on doors. And I came across sales closing techniques. I came across one sales closing technique, and I'd never seen it before, never heard of it before. And I said, OMG, OMG, this is perfect for me. And I went out and I was making one or two sales a week. I went out, I made three sales in 45 minutes cold calling. I had to go and sit on the curb and pant. I, was, I couldn't believe. I was Suddenly my, my income tripled. Within one year I was earning 10 times more than I ever dreamed I would ever earn in my life. And everybody I taught it to doubled or tripled their, their income. And, but I would never have found that simple way of asking a question and responding to it if I wasn't constantly reading and learning. M Charlie Munger, who is Warren Buffett's, Buffett's best friend and advisor, said if you are not continually reading and upgrading your skills, he said, you have zero chance in business in the 21st century. You have no chance at all. It's only a matter of time before you're out of business. So the flip side is dedicate yourself to lifelong learning. Just keep learning, breathe in, breathe out, never listen to the radio, listen to educational audio programs, listen to sales and marketing, time management and business development and communications. I mean, this stuff is wonderful. And if you learn this stuff and internalize this stuff, you're going to see transformations in your life. Everybody does. Absolutely. Um, all right, well, unfortunately, I think we're coming to the end of our time together today. Um, as a final reminder, if you really like what we were talking about, but you're kind of looking for a place to get started, um, Brian and I both encourage you to download Brian's exclusive one hour business plan. It's completely free. It's at briantracy.com slash business plan. So please check it out and then let us know what you think. Um, so Brian, I guess any final words of advice for our budding entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, and aspiring business owners out there? Well, one of my favorite observations, and I, I've put in, as I said, 150,000 hours in 50 years, is that you have more potential than you could use in 100 lifetimes. Is that everybody who's rich today was once poor. 
Everybody's at the top of their field who's once at the bottom. And what they did is they made a decision. I found, I've studied this, I've done programs on it, is making a decision that you are going to create a great life. That you're going to start and build your own business, no matter how many problems or mistakes you have, which are part of the learning process, and you're just going to keep on until you're successful. And if you make that decision and stick to it, you're going to be astonished what will happen to you in the months and years ahead. Awesome advice, Brian. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining everyone today, um, and we'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.